Good afternoon, and thank you so much for tuning in to our midweek Bible study here at Shehalem Christian Fellowship. Uh, we're just continuing on, uh, as we do, as is our habit, going through the Old Testament, picking up right where we left off in the book of Jeremiah. So we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 4 today, so if you want to turn there, uh, we'll get started in just a second. Uh, and as a reminder, we do meet as well on um, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Uh, in person out at the West Shehalem Friends Church. So we'd love to have you join us there. You can check out, uh, just type that name, West Shehalem Friends Church, into your Google Maps uh, here in Newbury, and you'll find it. Uh, or you can you can get a link directly on our website if you go over there as well. Love to have you there. We have our, uh, our Bible study here in Jeremiah doing it in person with you. Uh, also, time of a small time of worship and, of course, fellowship afterwards. And we also have our middle school and our high school groups joining us there at the same time. So it's been a real blessing here uh, to, to do this in person again. It's been a long time. Uh, we just started here in June. Uh, last time we did it in person before that was back pre-COVID. Uh, so it's been really a, a huge blessing to be back in person again. So, uh, But we'll keep this uh, live stream going for those of you who can't make it. Uh, do do uh, appreciate you tuning in, uh, at least to hear the word. Um, it's a it's truly a blessing, as you know, to, to hear from God's word. And then on Fridays at 4 p.m. the same time, you can catch our live stream, excuse me, of the New Testament, our New Testament study. We're currently in the book of Acts, just wrapped up Acts chapter 2 last week. So Micah will be taking us through Acts chapter 3 uh, this coming weekend. So it proved to be a a great study, so we'd love to have you join us there. Uh, it's the same teaching, of course, that's also given out on Sunday mornings, and this week we'll be meeting. Uh, we've been invited again to meet out at 14141 Northeast Cooney Road. So it's uh, always a blessing to be out there and meet and go through the Word together to worship in song, to take of communion, to to uh, hear the teaching of the word and to fellowship and prayer. So it's uh, always a blessing. Love to have you out there. Would love to see you. But uh, if you can't make it, of course, uh, again, uh, j jump on the, the website, grab the, the teaching online uh, and, uh, and, and follow along with us as we continue uh, going through the book of Acts. So uh, without further ado, let's turn back over to Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 4 will be actually beginning in verse 3. We finished up verse 2 uh, last week because it was a good break in the prophecies where, where Jeremiah was teaching here or where he was prophesying, excuse me, and uh, we'll get started here in verse 3. You know, the psalmist said, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. And that's why we continually stick to the word of God, because it's the only thing, really, the only thing that can truly give us hope. And personally, I've never been so great at waiting. I don't know about you, but uh, waiting isn't exactly my forte, but the scriptures tell us to wait on him. And while we wait on him, we are to be active. As the psalmist was, it says he waited in his word. Uh, we're to be active, and, and uh, furthermore, we're to be ready we're to be repaired, uh, it's not repaired, prepared. We're to be ready, we're, be, we're to be prepared. Uh, we're to watch, to be sober. Those are the kind of, that's the kind of language the New Testament uses. Uh, to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God and to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So when we wait for the Lord, we wait actively. And lucky for us, in this waiting, in this waiting for the Lord, we don't have to pack anything. We don't have to pack anything for the day of the Lord, for the time when he returns. And that's good news for me because I am a terrible packer. <laughs> I'm always either underpacking or overpacking. I tend to, okay, I'm going to be gone for four days, so I need six changes of clothes. I don't know why I do that. Uh, it just a uh, bad habit. I don't know. Maybe I just uh, feel like I'm going to get stranded at an airport or uh, broken down on the side of the road and, and lost in the jungle. I don't know. I don't know why I do that, but I'm a terrible packer. I either overpack or I forget half the things I need. Uh, one time, uh, my wife loves to remind me of this story. When uh, when we were first married and we were going on our honeymoon to uh, Hawaii, uh, specifically to Kauai, the, the Garden Island, um, which, by the way, uh, the Garden Island there, uh, and as Jenny had warned me, it gets the most rainfall. Uh, I think if I, I didn't, I didn't double check my facts here, but I'm pretty sure it's one of the highest, if not the highest rainfall uh, per year in the United States. 
and uh, lots and lots of rain there in Kauai. And we were we got married in May. So my wife told me before we left, she says, hey, just so you know, it is the rainy season in Kauai. So this is as I was packing. She's she's just giving me a heads up. Hey, it's the rainy season. Now, I'm an Oregon boy. So uh, born and raised and uh, and very, very much used to the rain. However, when I hear rain, it's going to be the rainy season. Uh, I, I, I thought to myself, well, okay, I'll pack accordingly. And so we get to the airport. We uh, shared luggage. We had a large bag to check. And as you guys know, that if you, if you pack too much, if, if it goes over a certain weight, I think it's 50 pounds, they charge you extra to take, the, to take the bag on the plane. Sure enough, we get there to the airport. We put the bag on the, uh, on the scale, and it's just a hair over. It's like 51 or 52 pounds. I don't remember exactly. And the, and the person says, well, I'm going to have to charge you. Or you can take a moment and shuffle your stuff around, maybe take something out and bring it in your carry-on. So we open the bag. And Jenny, just looking at it, is shocked because there's my winter coat sitting stuffed in the bag. <laughs> my winter coat and a couple pairs of jeans because, hey, it's rainy season in Hawaii, so I better be prepared. Uh, well, obviously, I didn't need all that. And so we, re we shuffled things around, I, and, and I had to do the walk of shame up to the airplane and out toward, you know, when we landed in Hawaii, uh, I'm carrying out of, on the plane in my hands my winter coat and uh, having to walk to the rental car, uh, basically sweating from the heat, uh, carrying my winter coat with me because, hey, it's rainy season, right? Uh, yeah, so I don't do that anymore, at least, well, I've never been back to Hawaii, so, <laughs> but I wouldn't make that mistake again. In Hawaii, of course, it does rain, and it rains hard, but it rains for about a good five minutes of just dumping buckets, and then it all just evaporates off the ground, and it's dry as a bone again, except uh, it's super humid in the air, so definitely a different kind of rain than we have in Oregon, something I wasn't exactly imagining or prepared for, so silly me. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing that when we are getting ready for the day of the Lord, when we're waiting for him, we don't have to pack anything. That's good news. You've heard the old adage, you'll never see a U-Haul behind a hearse because you can't take it with you. So we don't have to pack anything. And that's good news for me. But we should be ready. We should be ready. So what do we do as we prepare? As we prepare and as we wait for the Lord, what do we do? Well, there's lots of uh, instruction in the, in the scripture on, on how to wait for the Lord. I just want to center in on one verse today at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And so, Lord, as we wait, as the psalmist did, Lord, as we wait for you, we hope in your word, knowing that you'll keep your word. Lord, you're, Lord, you're good for your word. We, we thank you for that. And I pray that you'd teach us, Lord. Your Holy Spirit would come, teach us your word, help us to understand you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, for context, again, we're picking up in chapter 4. We went through chapter 3 last week. We started in chapter 3, verse 6, uh, went through chapter 4, verse 2. You can check out the teaching online if you have it, if you missed it. Grab it off Spotify or off our, off our website on one of the videos. Um, but we have a, a prophecy of Jeremiah that are spoken during the reign of Josiah. Josiah, the last good king of Judah. And he began, Jeremiah, in this prophecy by comparing the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom. And he called out Judah's hypocritical return. You see, if you remember, during Josiah's reign, Josiah had started a revival in the land. He cleaned up the land of the idols and he restored worship in, in the land and, and got rid of the false gods. But the Lord saw the heart. Josiah's heart was good. Josiah's heart, he was following the Lord with all his strength and with all his mind, with all his soul. But the people, the people not so much. They were externally, you know, focused on the Lord, trying to clean up their act, trying to show uh, an external religion, but not an inward change of heart. So he called them to return with their whole heart and put away their idols once and for all. And, and we're picking up in the middle of that prophecy there as he stopped in, in verse two, 
excuse me, in verse one of chapter one saying, return to me. And if you return to me, if you will return, he says, return to me, return to me. So we continue on here in the days of Josiah, picking up in verse three of Jeremiah chapter four. And we're going to read to start our study from verse three to verse 10. It says there, thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. Set up the standard toward Zion Take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, Clothe yourselves with sackcloth, lament and wail, for the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes, the priests, shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace whereas the sword reaches the heart. So in verses 3 through 10 here, the people are warned to get ready for the coming invasion from the north. Soften your hearts, he says. Take refuge, lament, wail, and humble yourselves. And then Jeremiah, at the, at the tail end of this, uh, this word from the Lord, Jeremiah is in great lamentation himself. Even even accusing the Lord of lying about his promises of peace. Break up your fallow ground, he starts. Break up your fallow ground. That is, soften your hearts. This isn't gardening advice. This isn't gardening advice. The soil of our heart needs tending to. The idea that Jeremiah is getting at, simply soften your heart. We have no shortage of, of, uh, of encouragements, instructions, exhortations in the scripture to do this, to pay attention to our hearts. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the writer of Hebrews warns us, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil and unbelieving heart that would depart from the living God. Exhort one another daily. While it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, even in the New Testament, the, the author of Hebrews there warns us to guard our hearts, to guard our hearts. As the Proverbs tells us, guard your heart, from, for from it flows the issues of life. We are never given encouragement to let our guard down and be okay with just letting our heart do what it wants to. Oh, the heart is deceitful above all things. So break up your fallow ground, he says, and circumcise yourselves to the Lord. He says, take away the foreskins of your heart. So just as we're not talking about gardening, we're also not talking about hygiene or medical procedures here. You know, circumcision was given in Genesis chapter 17 as a sign of the covenant between God and Abraham and the people of Israel, his children. But the Lord is emphasizing here that it's the inward person, it's the heart that is what truly matters. Paul capitalized on this in the book of Romans, telling us that circumcision is the seal of the righteousness which comes through faith, Romans chapter four, verse 11. And it is inward, circumcision, he says, is of the heart, Romans chapter two, verse 29. Which leads me to the question, so if he's telling us to circumcise our heart, how do we do that? 
How do you do that? Obviously, we're not talking about heart surgery here. Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Paul says again, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. That is, those who would tell you you need to be circumcised if you're going to follow the Lord, if you're going to be a Christian. There was people teaching that. He says, beware of that. Beware of that. For we are the circumcision, he says. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus, and who have no confidence in the flesh. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. So as Jeremiah warns here, as Jeremiah encourages, prepare your heart, prepare your heart, break up your fallow ground, and take refuge. Verse six, take refuge, prepare your heart, take refuge. And verses in verse eight, lament and wail. He says, lament and wail. And Jeremiah does just that. In verse 10, he laments. He says, oh, Lord God, surely you have deceived this people. His lamentation here is mixed with frustration. Yet, he remained faithful. Isn't that great? Jeremiah, though he was frustrated, though he was confused, though as it seems here, maybe he was angry. Yet he continued in faithfulness to preach the Lord's word, even when he didn't fully understand the message himself. Because we see, as the scripture tells us, we see through a glass dimly. But even Balaam knew that the Lord wasn't deceptive, or at least maybe Balaam didn't know, but Balaam said, and you remember Balaam, the prophet, the prophet who tried to curse the children of Israel, but the Lord wouldn't let him do that. Or you remember him in one of his prophecies. He says in, in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, he says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor, the son of, nor a son of man that he should repent. He Has he said and, and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make good? The Lord isn't a liar. Jeremiah accuses the Lord of deceiving the people, but Balaam, through the the spirit that was upon him, tells us God isn't a liar. God doesn't deceive. But that doesn't keep us from sometimes reading the scriptures and scratching our heads a little bit. What does the Lord mean by this? I'm confused. Jeremiah was confused too. So when you're unsure, when I'm unsure of the scriptures, there's a few things that I try to remind myself of. One is that God is good. That's the simplest one. God is good. I know when I look at it and I think, oh, this doesn't seem good. I can remind myself, no, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. And secondly, God is love. God is good. God is love. These are fundamental and basic and uh, truths that we can cling to. He is good. He is love. He does not change. Christ Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the same. He is good. He is love. He does not change. He is right. He's always right. And he's always just. God is good. God is love. He never changes. He is right. And he is just. So I can I can remember those things. Now that's only just a handful of, of, of truths that we know that we know that we know about the Lord that we can assure ourselves of. And they help me. And there's a song we've been singing at church. Josh was so gracious to introduce it to us. I'm fighting a battle. There's a line there in that song that's just so great. He says, I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. We know that Christ loved us. He gave himself for us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, gave his life for us. So when we don't know what he's doing, we know what he's done and we know we can trust in that. And so Jeremiah, though he's frustrated, he goes straight to the Lord with his frustration, with his struggle, and this won't be the last time. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. We can go straight to the Lord. We can go straight to him. Well, we continue on here in verse 11. We're going to read from verse 11 through 21. We saw in the first part the command to get ready. The people uh, told there's an invasion coming from the north. They're told, get ready. And then we pick up in verse 11. And we'll read here from 11 through 21. It says, 
At that time, it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I will also speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come like the clouds and his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make mention to the nations, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of of Judah. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around. Because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness. Because it is bitter, because it reaches to the heart, to your heart. Verse 19, O oh my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Verses 11 through 21 here, as a result of the people's wickedness, the coming destruction of Jerusalem is foreseen, and the people are warned yet again to turn from their ways, to cleanse their hearts, which, by the way, we know from past studies, we cannot cleanse our hearts on our own. We need to be washed. We need to be cleansed by Jesus Christ. But he warns them, cleanse your hearts. And I believe that's a that's a, that's, a, that's a clear call to come to the Lord, come to him, to allow him to clean your heart. And Jeremiah, again, at the end of the, of the section here, lamenting because the devastation is sure to come. And he wonders, how long? How long? Well, verse 13, he shall come, verse 13, he shall come. And who are we talking about here? The king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, he will come. He will come because, verse 18, your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. Now, don't mistake this as all bad things happen because you did something bad. That's not what's being said here. Your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. But scripture doesn't teach karma and scripture doesn't teach superstition. That's not how the Lord works. Job's friends You remember in the book of Job, they made that mistake. They constantly blamed Job. You're going through hard times. Things are bad. You must have sinned. No, that's not how the Lord works. That's not how the Lord works. And we ought to be very careful before we assume that because something bad is happening, either in our life or in somebody else's life, it's because we did something wrong. Now, sometimes, sometimes bad things happen because we do bad things. And that's very true. So it doesn't change the truth that you reap what you sow. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So the principle stands. And the Lord calls them out here and says, it's your ways and your own doings that have, that have caused this to come to you. But again, don't mistake, just all, don't, don't take that to mean that all bad things happen because you did something bad. That's not what's being taught here. That's not what the Bible teaches. But oh, Jeremiah, again, and we'll see this so often in the book of, the, of Jeremiah, he laments. He laments again at the end of this prophecy. He's not... He's not happy to speak these words. He says, verse 19, I am pained. I am pained in my very heart. Oh, there's no shortage of pain among God's people. David, the psalmist, he had his share of pain. And in Psalm chapter 55, 
I would love to read the whole thing with you. We don't have time. So I would just encourage you to open that psalm. I, it's one of the psalms that I like to look to frequently uh, when things, when, when my heart is pained, like Jeremiah's and when, when I'm wrestling, when I'm, when I, when I need the Lord to give me the words to speak to him. It's a psalm that I like to open up and I, I like to repeat the words back as a prayer. Just to grab a couple verses from that psalm. Psalm 55 verse 2. David says, attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and I moan noisily. Have you ever felt like that? I am restless in my complaint. I have so much to say. I'm restless and, and I moan. Lord, hear my, hear my cry. And then later in the psalm, in verse 16, he says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord will save me. Cast your burdens to the Lord, verse 22 of that psalm. Cast your burden to the Lord, and he will sustain you. Oh, there is no shortage of pain. I am pained in my very heart, Jeremiah said. And how long, verse 21, he wonders, how long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? I think this, this question of how long, Jeremiah might have been asking, how long will I see these prophecies? How long will I see this coming? Or he might be saying, how long will this last? How long will this last? Well, interestingly, 20-something years later in the book of Jeremiah, in, the, in chapter 25, Verses 3 and verse 11, the Lord tells Jeremiah exactly how long the captivity will last. But that, that's about 20 years later in his ministry. We don't know exactly the time frame. Jeremiah asked how long, and the Lord didn't answer him. The Lord didn't answer him. But what we do know about the Lord is he is patient. I said he didn't answer him. He didn't answer him right away. He answers him later. The Lord is patient. The Lord is patient. From the exodus to the exile, it's, it's about a thousand years at least where the Lord faithfully sent his messengers, faithfully warned his people. His people. And Jeremiah, hears, he's, he's seeing it coming. It, he's, he's very, very close. It's going to be in his lifetime. And he says, Lord, how long? How long? Well, when we ask that same question, how long? We can know some things. We can know some things. We can know that God is patient. God is patient. God knows our days. He knows our days. Before they were ever written, Psalm 139 says, he knows our days. We can know that nothing surprises him. He is patient. He knows our days and nothing surprises him. And we can know that our days are just a vapor. Just a vapor. The, Lord, the, the, the scripture tells us so many times the days that we live are like a twinkling of an eye, a blink of the eye. So short, though it feels so long sometimes. In James, in the New Testament, in chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, he says, Therefore, be patient until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently until it receives the early and latter rain. You also, he says, be patient. You be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Be patient. Be patient. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers and above all things, have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins. So we saw in the first section of the chapter in verses 3 through 10 that we read, we saw the command to get ready, to get ready for the invasion that's coming from the north. And then in verses 11 through 20, 21, the consequence of rebellion because of the people's wickedness, destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem is on its way. Well, the last part of the chapter, verses 22 through 31, we'll read here. It says, Oh, excuse me, I said, uh, yeah, verse 22 through 31. It says, therefore, my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and indeed, it was without form and void. In the heavens, they had no light. 
I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken, I have purposed, and I will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen. They shall go into the thickets, and they shall go, uh, excuse me, they shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man shall dwell in it. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that is, dress up for the idols that they were worshiping, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. Much like as we, as we referenced in, in an earlier study, the prophets of Baal there dressed themselves up and, and, and uh, gyrated on the altar, hoping to get the attention of Baal, the false god. But nobody answered. No one paid attention. What will you do, the Lord says, when you are plundered? Well, verse 31, I have heard a voice. As of a woman in labor, the anguish of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands, saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Well, in verses 22 through 31, because the people have forsaken the knowledge of God, the total desolation of the land is not going to be stopped. The Lord has purposed to bring it about. My people, he says in verse 22, my people are foolish. The very root of their issue was not just knowledge of right and wrong, but verse 22, knowledge of the Lord. They have not known me. That's why they're foolish. They're not foolish because they don't know math or they don't know science or they don't know right from wrong. No, they know right from wrong. The Lord has given him, given them his law. They're foolish, he says, because they have not known me. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the scriptures tell us. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Not because they didn't have the opportunity to know, but as Hosea says there, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected the knowledge of me. They rejected it. The knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of God through Christ is the one thing Paul says in the book of Philippians that's to be desired above all things. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, the things that I counted as gain before I knew Christ, the righteousness that I'd built for myself, he says, I count those things as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness that's from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God apart, excuse me, the righteousness uh, of which is from God through faith. That knowledge, the knowledge of Christ, that I may know him, verse 10 of Philippians chapter 3, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, that I may know Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but his. But because the people rejected that knowledge, because the people rejected the Lord himself, it says, verse 27, the whole land shall be desolate. And I, but, but. I will not make a full end. The, the land will be desolate, but I will not make a full end. The Lord ensures he will not completely destroy, or at least not this time, not yet. You see, this prophecy is specific to the north coming and taking Jerusalem captive 
the Babylonian empire coming in and taking them away. And he says, I won't make a full end. Not yet. Not yet. When it comes to discipline and when it comes to judgment, the Lord knows exactly what he's doing and we can trust him. Paul told us the firm foundation of the Lord stands that he, having this seal, that he knows those who are his. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. He knows what he's doing. He knows those that are his. And Nahum, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, another of the minor prophets he says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. He's not going to make mistakes. He knows. He knows. And when that day comes, when he does make a full end, he's not going to make any mistakes. But that day, we can be certain that day will come. Because, verse 28, he says, I have purposed and I will not relent. In this case, the judgment of the Babylonians is coming. The Lord says, you can count on it. I have purpose and I won't change my mind. The Lord will fulfill his eternal purposes. That is certainty. This is the certainty of death for those without Christ. But it's comfort for us, for, for those who, of us who have known him, who have, or, or rather been known by him. For us who have received the gift of life, it is a comfort knowing that he will fulfill the work that he has began in us. Another from the Psalms, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Psalm 138 verses seven through eight, and particularly verse eight there in Psalm 138 verse eight, he says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Oh, do not forsake the work of your hands. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. He has purposed. He has purpose and he's not changing his mind. But in the midst of troubles, verse 31, woe is me, my soul is weary. My soul is weary. The weariness of this life, it is very real. The stubbornly persistent illusion of time makes it go slower when there's pain and faster in times of joy. Oh, time, it's not our friend. It's not our friend. Oh, soul, are you wearied and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Savior, a life more abundant and free. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Come to me, Matthew. Chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me. All you who weary and uh, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is your soul weary? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here in the chapter, we have the command to get ready to get ready for the coming invasion in this case, and us to be ready for the day of the Lord. Then verses 11 through 21, the consequences of rebellion. The people, because of their wickedness, the destruction of Jerusalem is on its way. And then the last section, verses 22 through 31, the certainty of retribution. Because the people have forsaken the knowledge of God, the total desolation of the land is not going to be stopped. But before we end our time, I'd like us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and read from there. In this, in this uh, thought of being ready, being prepared for the day of the Lord, and what do we do while we wait? 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> Should have marked it so I could turn there a little bit faster, but I guess it gives you some time too <laughs> to get there. First Peter chapter four. <clears throat> it says there, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh ha has ceased from sin. 
that he should no longer live the rest of the time, his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Time is short. Time is short. It is high time for us to be ready, to be awake, to live, as Peter says here, the rest of our time in the flesh, for, not for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, just like the people of Israel did here, and destruction came upon them. We've spent enough time living like that. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There will be consequence, eternal consequences to sin. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another <clears throat> as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, verse 12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Oh, the weariness and the pain of this world, it's real. Don't be, don't, don't think it's strange as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you also may be glad with exceeding joy. Oh, it is real. It is real and it's not worth comparing. The troubles of this life are not worth comparing to the joy that is ahead for us. So if you are reproached, verse 14, for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. What we reap is what we'll sow. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For the, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Oh, he is faithful, so faithful. Faithful to complete his word. Faithful to come. He will come. He will come. Faithful to finish the work that he has started in us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for being faithful. Lord, we thank you for your promises. Lord, that you promise to come, that you promise to keep us. Lord, help us to cling to you. Help us to know you, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we wait, help us to be patient. Help us to be active. Help us to be prepared. Lord, in your word, we hope. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, pray that I get to see you here at, at our, our midweek study in person or on Sunday as we gather together at the barn. Oh, I almost forgot at the barn if you've made it all the way through the teaching today. Uh, I forgot to mention it earlier, but we are having a barbecue. So so do uh, come enjoy some burgers and, and hot dogs and bring a dish, a side dish and enjoy that together. So uh, Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. 
May the, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.